Our next presenter is Dr. Martin G. Abeg, Jr. Marty Abeg is Professor of Religious Studies, Director of the MA Program in Biblical Studies, and Co-Director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute at Trinity Western University. He received his PhD from Hebrew Union College, gained an international attention in 1991 when he began reassembling unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls and making them available to the public. Marty's publications include The Dead Sea Scrolls, A New Translation, The Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, three volumes of Hebrew scroll text, and a massive concordance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He has also contributed to computer access databases to facilitate biblical scholarship. Dr. Abed, we now present your paper entitled Paul and James on the Law in Light of the Scrolls. Thank welcome. you very much. Thank oh, you. by the way, you may, wish to, you may wish to welcome Marty with a standing ovation. I know you've been seated for a while. <laughs> You may be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, it strikes me in, the, in this kind of setting that, uh, you know, it used to be uh, in, you know, in uh, times past, uh, perhaps a, a symphony of Beethoven, for example, you would hear once in your lifetime. Now we're so accustomed to be able to buy the CD and uh, see it on the, uh, the video and all sorts of access. We've lost the ability, I think, to hear and a simulate uh, large groups of material uh, in uh, one sitting like this, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fall prey to uh, just overloading you with all kinds of stuff here that uh, hopefully we can make some sense of. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to nail down one specific uh, image, and if I could have one of the handouts too when, when uh, you finish circulating that I can point to that at some... Oh, thank you very much. I will point to this at uh, some point and uh, try to uh, help you nail down the one thing that I would like to leave you with, and then hopefully we can build a bit on that as we move through the paper. And I begin. In a recent newspaper article in The Sun, not the Vancouver Sun, mind you, but that eminent weekly that graces the checkout counter at your local grocery store, the front page headline announces, Amazing Predictions in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Among the bulleted items reported found in the scrolls are proof of reincarnation, and detailed accounts of previous lives, miracle cures for AIDS, cancer, and arthritis, and the history of the end of the world. But the most astounding, and the item of deepest interest to the Sun's readership, judging from the picture accompanying the article, is the whereabouts of the king. Not David or Solomon, but Elvis. <laughs> The article claims, but the strangest revelation of the Dead Sea Scrolls pertains to a modern-day prophet named Elvis. One of the fragments found in the caves spells out the name Elvis. It says he will be beloved, a beloved prophet who will return to the Holy Land when his mission in other countries is finished, and his prophecies will be fabled in song and story. And the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls may indeed tell us where he is today. There are additional clues to our deep-seated expectations of what might be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. David Letterman has included the scrolls as a focus of his famous Top Ten segment. Among the ten, in the marginal decorations, you will find Waldo. <laughs> Without getting too specific, Presbyterians are in a lot of trouble. And number one, complete with drum roll, lots of money-saving coupons. A cartoon from the 80s represents three couples enjoying coffee and a dessert following dinner. The hostess announces, who could have imagined that such a wonderful recipe for brownies would be hidden away in the Dead Sea Scrolls? <laughs> and I would suggest that any future plans for a movie concerning the saga of the scrolls, uh, scrolls find, would, uh, would only be complete in our minds if uh, Harrison Ford topped the cast as Indiana Jones and, of course, the most explosive of the, uh, the scrolls would be hidden away and forgotten in a warehouse, fade to black. Such is the effect of the scrolls on the curious public. Our interest in the scrolls, exemplified by the very crowd here today, and I, I imagine the room full from side to side, so uh, uh, kind of spread out a little bit, if you will. <laughs> I think the snow has kept us down just a bit. 
Uh, the, uh, the crowd here today, right, uh, where do I pick up? Okay, continues unabated since the, their discovery in the 40s and early 50s. We sense they contain wonderful treasure, and so they do. Alas, not the recipe for killer fudge brownies, or the 11th commandment, but important background to the worldview of the Jewish writers who penned the New Testament and the ancient rabbis who gathered the materials uh, which have provided the foundations for modern Judaism. As Shemar Yahu Talmon wrote, the scrolls promise to give some help for partly inscribing the proverbial blank page between the Hebrew Bible and the Mishnah on one hand and between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament on the other. This is the purpose of today's session and the interest of each of the speakers. I myself am frequently asked, often by reporters looking for the latest bit of trash, what are the most significant discoveries in the scrolls? The topic of my paper today is at the peak of my personal top ten list. In 1988, a previously unpublished document began circulating among scroll scholars, often arriving in the proverbial brown manila envelope with no return address. This document was of obvi obvious importance both for, uh, for both of Talmon's stated interests, and it was for this purpose that in the spring following the receipt of the surreptitious mailing, Hebrew Union College listed in its graduate uh, catalog the course Hellenistic Literature 25, taught by Professor Benzion Wachholder. The course was devoted solely to the study of this document, which was only available at the time in a Xerox copy. If you can just imagine uh, uh, having a class that uh, your textbook was a Xerox copy of a handwritten document. That's what we were uh, dealing with at the time. The handwritten notes thankfully proved to be bona fide. And from that time until now, this work, known by its acronym MMT, which stands for Mixat Maase HaTorah, or Some of the Works of the Law, has never been far from my thinking and has taken its rightful place as one of the most important of the Dead Sea Scroll documents. It was fully five years later, in the fall of 1994, that I had the first opportunity to discuss my, my understanding of this scroll in an article entitled, Paul Works of the Law on the MMT, and published in the Biblical Archaeological Review. I concluded rather simply that the phrase, Mixat Maaseh Torah, some of the works of the law, uh, was the Hebrew equivalent to the expression, works of the law, found in the Apostle Paul's books, Galatians and Romans. In fact, the phrase occurs nowhere else in antiquity. Aside from Paul's expression, erga namu, works of the law, in eight instances in these two books, Romans 3.20, 28, Galatians 2.16, three times there, uh, 3, 2, 5, and 10. And in fact, all of these I've listed on your, uh, your handout here, or most of them. Using the Septuagint for lexical confirmation, statistically and contextually, the translation of masse, or work, and by ergon, and Torah, law, by namas, is a near certainty. The works of the law that our Dead Sea Scroll writer refers to are thus typified by the 24 plus precepts which are detailed in the main body of the document of his text. These concern, in the main, acts which trespass the boundaries between the pure and the impure in the temple precincts. I concluded that the MMT reveals that Paul was not jousting with windmills, but was indeed squared off in a dramatic duel that ultimately defined a form of Messianic Judaism that became known as Christianity. Now, in your handout, I've given you uh, kind of the main points here, and the, I'd like to just uh, pause here, refer back uh, just for a second to uh, what I have already said so that uh, you understand what I'm driving home here and we can move forward. Uh, the, uh, the term mixat maaseh Torah, and maaseh Torah especially, uh, in the Hebrew is uh, we need to, uh, to be able to uh, transfer that to hopefully if my, uh, my sense was correct uh, to the Greek and the way I did that was to, uh, to test the, the translation of the Hebrew words uh, mase, work, and Torah, law uh, by using the Septuagint which we have a copy of a manuscript right here that refers to most of uh, the Septuagint if not all and the, uh, the uh, words uh, from the Septuagint which translated these texts were found to be, uh, by and large, uh, almost entirely for Torah, it was a namas, and a uh, large percentage and contextually almost uh, certain that Maase was translated as uh, ergon. So with uh, that little bit in hand, I felt that uh, the, 
uh, connection we could make uh, from our Dead Sea Scroll writers' use of Masea Torah to Paul's use of Erga Namu was uh, pretty sound. Uh, the, the, uh, the excitement of that, uh, just so you can capture this a bit, is that uh, prior to the, the uh, discovery of this document in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there had been no other occurrence of this particular phrase, whether either in the Greek or in the, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, in antiquity, uh, either in Jewish writings or other uh, early Christian writings, until, of course, the church fathers and the rabbis began commenting on, uh, on the earlier writings. So that was rather exciting. In a sense, I felt that, uh, that we had found the smoking gun, that which scholars had been looking for behind the discussions of works of the law, both in uh, Galatians and Romans. And that's where I ended in the first article. Now, the, uh, the second article that I did, uh, published in Dead Sea Discoveries in 1999, uh, here I began probing the, the significance of the parallelism. I discussed the possibility that I could uh, be accused of extravagance or only supposed similarity and convinced myself and hopefully my readers that I had not transgressed the dangerous morass of parallelomania. Thus, I pushed on to investigate the significance of, co of such common language. I began with the thesis that the Qumran manuscripts might now offer the opportunity of aiding our search for the type of Judaism with which Paul was interacting. In the main, I simply underlined the conclusions of E.P. Sanders, who had been down the same path, albeit from the starting point of rabbinic literature some 20 years before. Stand Sanders, with, with J.D.G. Dunn in his wake, had been re uh, recognized as the chief founders of a new perspective on Paul, a term coined by Dunn and the title of a 1983 article in the bulletin of the John Rylands Library. I came at this discussion through the back door, as it were, for even as late as 1994, hunkered down as I was with the Qumran text, I was blissfully unaware of the significance of Dunn and Sanders for my own studies. I had become a new perspective scholar, not as a follower of Dunn, but as a student of the MMT. In relation now to the Qumran manuscripts, this perspective posits that the sectarians who collected, copied, and perhaps in some cases even composed the scrolls believed that righteousness originated with God, not man. The, com the community entrance requirement and thus right relationship with God is clearly shown to be repentance of sin. And that knee-jerk reaction that might suggest that the MMT and the community literature as a whole reflects a works earn righteousness religion is hardly justified. Again, to emphasize, entrance into the community was always couched in the language of repentance. Maintenance, once one was a member of the covenant, was on the basis of the member's understanding of the law as interpreted by the community. Jews who refused to repent, as well as covenanters who subsequently rejected the restrictions of the law, were judged in accordance with the law. Repentance was not possible for Gentiles. They were judged in consonance with their evil deeds. There does not appear to be any variation in any of the scrolls concerning this basic pattern. As Sanders has well written, the place of obedience to the law in the overall scheme is always the same. It is the consequence of being in the covenant and the requirement for remaining in the covenant. Nothing in the scrolls bolsters the Protestant teaching that a Jew of antiquity would have considered himself saved or other, uh, in other words, entering into a, a relationship with God on the basis of doing the works of the law. Thus, to clarify the significance of the works of the law, I ask my students the following set of questions. Name this group. They honor their parents. They do not murder, commit adultery, steal, or bear false, false witness. witness. Now, apart from the perhaps recognizable Bibleese, such as the phrase, bear false witness, this list could describe any number of groups in polite society. However, if I would append the fact that they circumcise their boys on the eighth day, eat no pork or shellfish, and do not mix dairy and meat products, you would easily recognize the group as Jews. What we have described in this second question have been variously called identity or boundary markers in the discussion of the new perspective on Paul. It is my thesis that the Qumran community and 4QMMT called these markers works of the law. Next, in a 2001 article entitled 4QMMT, Paul and Works of the Law, I explored the results of my study on the reading of Galatians 3 and concluded that it is not being saved by faith that is the issue in the letter of Galatians, but continuing in faith. Among the several ramifications in chapter 3 is the conclusion that Genesis 15.6 is by no stretch of the imagination 
uh, the beginning of Abraham's relationship with God, and thus does not have to have uh, the salvific import that those following Martin Luther have long taught. Nor is Paul to be accused of reinterpreting Habakkuk 2.4, Galatians 3.11. His point, in parallel with the prophet, is clear. No matter what tribulations life might bring, the righteous man shall live, that is, conduct himself, by faith, not by works of the law. Certainly not an exhaustive treatment of 4QMMT, but an interesting journey nonetheless. Now after four years of other endeavors, I have the opportunity to visit the topic once more. The twofold motivation being the conference today and the challenge uh, to the position I have outlined that have begun to appear in print. The first challenge has come from a former student of Craig Evans, Peter Flint, and myself, Jacqueline Duru, in a 2003 article entitled The Concept of Works of the Law in Jewish and Christian Literature. Although Deru does not address my position directly, Jimmy Dunn in a series of articles which he has published on Paul and the New Perspective being the focus of her article, her conclusions also stand in sharp contrast to my own. Deru posits six questions which she considers to be weaknesses in the argument that works of the law concern not the law in general, but rather in particular. In other words, she believes that here we are dealing with ethical rather than cultic or halakhic issues not border issues, in other words, or identity issues. These taken in order will provide a worthy way of working through some of the key issues of our discussion. And her first question, if works of the law are identity badges, are they Jewish national identity badges separating Jews from gen Gentiles or identity badges which separate Jews from Jews? I would answer, yes. <laughs> Actually, this question gets at the very nature of the issue. If we can bring the discussion into our own setting, doing a bit of rough hewn uh, sociological or sociology, the uh, situation would look like this. A Baptist in discussion with a Catholic concerning issues of distinction would in the main echo the issues of 4QMMT. If on the other hand the discussion were between a Christian and a Jew, they would echo the matters of Galatians. Both would be conversations which would concern issues defining the identity of the speakers. It is highly unlikely that either of our proposed discussions would concern such matters as theft, murder, or honoring one's mother or father. The, for the former discussion, that one between the Baptist and the Catholic, might take up such issues, issues as baptism, confirmation, and congregational authority or lack thereof. Whereas the latter, that between the Christian and the Jew, would perhaps orbit about circumcision and kosher issues, the festival calendar, and messianism. All, in my understanding, would be determined by the term works of the law. Thus, the phrase is quite agile and largely concerns issues of legal interpretation, doctrinal or halakhic interpretation, rather than ethics. Although Daru clearly desires to limit Dunn to either national identity markers or practices that distinguish Jews from other Jews, I see no reason to make the parameters so confining our bit of rough-hewn sociology demonstrates that our, conversation, our conversations are simply at different points along the same lines. Her second question, is the phrase works of the law found in 4Q 174? Now this is, uh, we're jumping into a conversation uh, a, a bit in the middle here, but we'll refer back to this in just a minute. So just allow me to read the translation of 4Q 174 that she, re she refers to. Allowing for this, the passage in question would then read, to that end, i.e. the temple uh, being established uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a kind of a situation that is not defiled, he, that being God, has commanded that they build him a temple of man and that in it they would sacrifice to him works of the law. And that would be our phrase, Mase HaTorah. Uh, thus, instead of, as other, other uh, translators have offered, and that in it they sacrifice to him deeds of thanksgiving, mase hatoda. The question involves the difficulty of re in the reading of a single Hebrew letter. It is, is it a dalit, leading to deeds of thanksgiving, or a resh, resulting in works of the law? Daru bears or bases her own understanding in some large part on answering this answer in the affirmative, or the fact that it's works of the law. 
The reasons for this will become evident in her fourth, or D, question. Given the problems involved in reading this rather difficult manuscript, we will likely never know the answer with any certainty. Torleif Elkvin, after examining the actual manuscript under high mag magnification, determined that the physical evidence is ambiguous. He is not a stakeholder in the discussion, and so I think he is, he is to be trusted as an unbiased witness of sorts. The notables lined up on either side of the issue give a credence to Elgvin's judgment. The physical evidence is ambiguous, and it would appear that the context is equally so. I will return to this point as it becomes important later in the paper. Her C question, or third question, is this. The connection has been made between Masaya Torah, works of the law, in 4Q174, that which we uh, just discussed, and 4QMMT, and Masav B'Torah, or uh, the works in uh, relation to the wall or, or the law or vis-a-vis -vis the law in the community rule. What are the implications of this important connection? Daru states that a close re reading of the community rule reads that in this document, works of the law comes to focus in ethical issues rather than ritual issues on which the Qumranites differ with outsiders. This is perhaps her most important challenge. The passages at 1QS, column 5, line 21, and column 6, line 18, as well as the coincident K4 manuscripts, contain a similar expression, Masav B'Torah, his works vis-a-vis -vis the, the law. Uh, these passages concern both the ranking members on one hand and the process of initiation into the covenant of the Yachad on the other. The focus of 1QS, column 5, line 21, and thus the antecedent to the pronoun his in this instance, is the community member. It reads, they shall investigate his understanding and works vis-a-vis -vis the law in order to determine his rank in the community. The focus of column 6, line 18, is the one who has passed a full year of his initiation period into the yachad or community. And I quote, the general membership shall inquire into the details of his understanding of the works of the law. If the initiate passes muster, he is initiated uh, more fully and steps are taken to incorporate his possessions into the community. Daru then reasons that it is important to read the following section, that is 1QS column 6 lines 24 on into column 7 line 25 for context, and as the focus in this section relates entirely to ethical behavior, that it follows that the term masav or masse ha-Torah, masav b-Torah, must also deal with ethical behavior. She fails, however, although context, as we all understand, is important, uh, she does fail to, uh, to, to see that uh, the, the new section is clearly set off by, uh, by vakats. In other words, it's a paragraph unto itself. And this resulting new section is also set off by an introductory sentence, which reads this way. These following are the rules by which cases are to be decided at community inquiry. The punishments for the following admittedly ethical stipulations are clearly determined and distinctly different from that which in the preceding section, which includes the phrase Maase HaTorah. The transgressions in the latter section are various periods of ban from the pure meals and reduction in food rations. The bans range from one year, a one year long expulsion for cursing or outburst in time of trial or for any other reason, perhaps we're to understand here taking the Lord's name in vain, to a 10-day punishment for anyone interrupting his companion while in session. In sharp contrast, failure to pass muster as to one's works of the law in the former discussion resulted in a demotion or promotion of rank for the member. And the prospect of further initiation into the secret teaching of the Yachad and incorporation of property for, that, uh, for the initiate. At CD 20, the Covenant of Damascus, or page 20, lines 6 through 8, the negative repercussions for the unsuccessful initiate are detailed. When his actions become evident according to the interpretation of the law, this is Masav Kafi Midrash Torah, similar expression, which the men of holy perfection live, no one is allowed to share either wealth or work with such a one, for all the holy ones of the Almighty have cursed him. So in other words, uh, the uh, ethical section which Daru refers to and would like to use to interpret Maaseya Torah is clearly a section unto itself and dealing with the, the bans as to uh, uh, food and the, uh, the involvement in the, uh, the purity, the uh, holy meals, whereas the previous section is, uh, is dealing with rank and interpretation of the law clearly set off uh, in the, uh, the text itself. 
The fourth question she asks, are works of the law actual or spiritual sacrifices, cultic or ethical deeds? This question, as we have discussed above, assumes that we follow Daru and others in determining that 4Q174, it does indeed read Ma Seha Torah rather than Ma Seha Todah, so works of the law. Assuming for the moment that, uh, that Daru is correct, it is not clear by context whether the works indicated are ethical or doctrinal slash halakhic. She would have us uh, understand that the phrase the asu et kol haTorah to do all the works of the law in column two, in other words, the next column, line two, is determinative. But the context does not qualify what is meant even here. And while the column one is most concerned with a commentary on the temple, column two, uh, the discussions have uh, removed to two steps actually. Uh, to a discussion of uh, Psalm 2 following an intervening four-line discussion of Psalm 1. An appeal to the deeds of David, uh, except for the murder of uh, Uriah, being offered up as a sacrifice at CD 5, I think besi is beside the point, and that's the next uh, issue that she goes to. It's not clear here whether works of the law is what is being referred to in this, this particular context. Then Daru follows her focus on David's deeds, uh, to, uh, to a discussion of Paul, or Paul's discussion of David. Her appeal to Romans 4, 6 through 8 is not at all convincing. At Romans 4, the material at hand concerns the question of when Abraham was reckoned as righteous by his believing God, before or after he was circumcised. And I do agree that, uh, given the context, the blessing of David, apart from works, is to be understood as works from the law. But the context also makes it perfectly clear that it is circumcision that is being described as a work of the law. David appears in the midst of this discussion only to show that even he did not work in order to merit God's favor. Instead, his sins were works is to be understood as works from the law. But the context also makes it perfectly clear that it is circumcision that is being described as a work of the law. David appears in the midst of this discussion only to show that even he did not work in order to merit God's favor. Instead, his sins were simply forgiven because he confessed them before God. There is no need to come to Deru's rather surprising conclusion here that because of this, works of the law must be understood as the opposite of sin. Move on to her fifth point. Are works of the law works performed or prescribed? In other words, are they deeds or precepts? I would suggest that this question misses the point. The real question is whether they were ethic or halakhic, not whether they were acts or simply rulings. A precept to circumcise most certainly brings an act of circumcision. A precept from 4QMMT demanding that the priest who is involved with the preparation of the ashes of the red heifer wait until evening in order to be pure means just that. The deed must follow. A priest made unclean by preparing the red heifer could not cleanse a person until the sun set a precept leading to an act. Similarly, in Baptist circles, the precept uh, to, uh, that baptism is by immersion brings the practice of such. The real point is that these precepts are best described as halakhic or doctrinal rather than ethical issues. And the fifth question, sixth question, excuse me. Did Jews of the Second Temple period think of works of the law as meritorious? Certainly they did not evidently as an entrance into the community or a relationship with God. And this is what many Christians assume when they hear, and it will be reckoned to you as righteous. This is decidedly not the case when all the evidence from antiquity is taken into account. Here, Sanders and Dunn are right. Neither the Qumran sectarians, nor I am convinced, Paul's Judaizers would have agreed that a person was saved by keeping the law. The sectarian did, however, consider that works of the law maintained his right standing with God both in the present and uh, in the eschaton. The second challenge to my thesis has come from Simon Gathercole in his new book, Where is the Boasting? Early Jewish Soteriology and Paul's Response to Romans 1 through 5. In chapter 2, Works and Final Vindication in the Qumran Literature, Gathercole writes, the most recent affirmation of Sanders' position on the Qumran literature is Martin Abegg's 4QMMT C2731 and Works of the Law. Isn't that an exciting title? Um, Abegg will uh, provide a con convenient dialogue partner, read Whipping Boy. 
here. His article attempts to show that the category works righteousness is highly inappropriate as a description of the pattern of religion in the Qumran literature as a whole. In other words, Gather Cole is challenging the whole, uh, the whole new perspective on Paul and my understanding of, of the support that the Qumran text might uh, bring to the, uh, to the table. Gather Cole then reviews my support for this determination and challenges two points first. My, first, my understanding that the works of the law in 4QMMT, and second, my determination that the entry requirements for initiation into the Qumran community was repentance, not works of the law. Gather Cole concludes from a study in the Hebrew Bible of the verb asa, to do, and uh, Torah, the law, that when these are side by side, the, uh, the object requires that the works of the law should be understood primarily as deeds done in obedience to the totality of the Torah. The frequency of this word pair is indeed evident, although it must be pointed out that, uh, again, the specific terminology, ma'se ha-Torah, works of the law, not just to do the law, but ma'aseha Torah, works of the law, is not. Indeed, the emphasis that Gather Cole reviews is quite common in the Qumran text as well, to the point that some researchers have suggested that the ancient name for the group may have been reflective of this focus. They are the Oseha Torah, or Ose Torah, or Essenes. It is instructive, however, to note, that the the, note the qualifications to this emphasis. And I won't go through all of these because I think I've mostly used up my time here already. But each of uh, the, uh, the quotations that I was going to bring here refer not just to the uh, doing the law, but doing the law according to the interpretation that was brought to the table by the community. So it's the interpretation of the law that then drives the Maaseha Torah, or works of the law. And uh, I have a number of uh, passages that I could read you in that regard. Uh, God, which is the focus of the, of the phrase, works of the law, uh, it consistently, hmm, I missed something there, oh, excuse me. It is the interpretation of the law, that which has been revealed by God, which is the focus of the phrase, works of the law. Consistently, this combination is brought into stark contrast with the practice of the rest of the Jews, those who are called wicked and ruthless, and from whom the sectarians sought to distinguish themselves. No doubt the emphasis was on the Torah in its entirety, but obeying the law was in accordance with the correct interpretation, that which had been revealed by God. The noun phrase, works of the law, is, as Gather Cole suggests, a natural development from the Hebrew Bible. But the phrase does not simply mean works of the law as God commanded, but rather works of the law which God has commanded and revealed fully only to us. It is impossible for me not to conclude that these works were not boundary issues in the very first instance. They determine the Qumran sect distinctly within Judaism as a whole, this aside from the question of their salvific value. It was a particular set of works of the law that defined the Qumran Judaism for what it was, its doctrinal stance, as it were. And though boundary defining in the first instance, uh, the result was obviously seen as determining one's eschatological well-being. If you are one of us, you are going where we are going. If you are not one of us, evidenced by a different set of doctrines, you're in trouble. Gather Cole's warning that the polemic context in which the phrase is used in 4QMMT cannot be transferred wholesale into the Pauline context and should not be understood as concrete deeds done in obedience to the totality of the law fails to stand up to the test in context of Galatians and Romans where works of the law is used only in the context of circumcision, kosher issues, and proper festival observance. In other words, again, works of the law are not just general doing the law. Works of the law is a very specific term which, uh, which is pointed at these, uh, these identity issues. And in Galatians and Romans, uh, these are specifically circumcision, kosher, and proper festival observance. Next and shortly, Gather Cole posits that the soteri soteriology of the Qumran literature is not so simple as Sanders and Abegg imply. No doubt this is true, and a global study of soteriology of the 700-some scrolls is certainly beyond the parameters of today's lecture or even the published form of this paper. But Gather Cole is concerned with the need to study Torah in order to vindicate and the, the uh, excuse me to be vindicated and rewarded on the last day, and reads my study with this foremost in mind: 
Thus, my comments, which focus on the function of works of the law as a test of the sectarians' right standing with the com within the community, are interpreted to mean that I have missed the importance of their future eschatology. I would respond that I have not missed this importance so much as I have concentrated my, my, uh, my attention on other issues. I would counter that Gather Cole, in his rush to final judgment, has missed the point of my own studies and almost, enti uh, almost entirely. The phrase works of the law is again not concerned with entrance but rather with maintenance issues. Not how one gets in but how one stays in. And I have been concentrating on the beginning of the journey rather than the end, where Gather Cole is uh, certainly concentrating on the end uh, rather than the beginning. As in all issues with the Dead Sea Scrolls, this event is still in its opening minutes. The bell announcing the first round concerning the important issues raised by 4QMMT is yet ringing in our ears. The first tentative punches have been thrown, and the match has only begun. <laughs> so I thank you. We will now invite uh, Dr. Evans and Dr. Collins, uh, our two other morning presenters, uh, to join Dr. Abeg at the table to receive your questions. <coughs> several passages there that, that you only commented on and, and did not share specifically with us. Would those, would those passages reflect any kind of diversity amongst the group of the, of the council, if you will? The, the passages that I mentioned uh, really don't go into detail as to what the interpretations were. That my point there was that uh, the doing of the law uh, when we use the phrase Ma Torah is specifically concerning uh, the interpretation you know, that comes along with the, uh, the, the community's understanding of this law. And most importantly, that, uh, that this interpretation was not uh, dealing with the ethical issues, you know, not the, uh, the stealing and murdering and such things, but it was dealing with the doctrinal or halakhic issues. Uh, such things as circumcision or uh, kosher issues, festival days, those kinds of things. So it's, uh, the works of the law specifically um, is specifically pointed uh, to their discussions of the law, their interpretations of the law, which drove these kinds of uh, disputes. Maybe the kinds of things that we could uh, that we could put in a statement of faith, as it were, that would define who we are as a community vis-a-vis -vis some other community. Is, is that uh, is that helpful? Share a follow-up about that. Uh, would you agree that in the sectarian scrolls there aren't really any significant halakhic differences? Differences with uh, within themselves. Within themselves, yes, I would agree. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're uh, they, they are virtually uh, one flaw in these issues. There may be some uh, varying uh, bearing on the smaller points, and varying on, for example, uh, once we have some of these issues discussed what the, uh, the penalty might be, or the length of the penalty, uh, those kinds of things. Thank you. I would like to ask a question which, uh, as a non-theologian, sorry. Um, there's a maintenance issue for the Essenes, which is to keep themselves right with the community and presumably with God. And from that comes a question which comes from that is the maintenance issue as far as John the Baptist was concerned and the question that comes out of that is did John the Baptist 
baptize people more than once. Now, this is uh, somewhat unusual question, which I, I'd like your opinion on. Mm. Yeah, that's an issue I can't, uh, it isn't part of my study, so uh, I, I don't think the details are really there to determine that. But that actually has, that's a good question. Did John baptize people more than once? And it's a burning issue right now in historical Jesus and I guess you could say historical John Baptist studies. And I did allude to it in I, I, my comments for Trump came uh, in my own paper. The traditional view is that it was a once only initiatory baptism. A person had repented and had joined the renewed people and were prepared to become part of this 12 group restored Israel. But recent studies have suggested that there may very well have been a purificatory dimension where the baptism would occur more often. And the analogy, therefore, is closer to the Jewish mikvah, which were, of course, used daily, and not just once only. And so uh, it's a raging dispute on that. And Part of the difficulty with this, John is at the Jordan, which I think points to a more initiatory orientation. But in the Gospel of John, he's not at the Jordan, he's at another location, which doesn't carry with it the Jordan typology. And so I have two very good friends, one representing one view and one representing the other. And so I sort of Waffle, or I always put it this way, I, I mediate. I <laughs> 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 suggest that I Bruce Chilton, who is purificatory, and it's Bob Webb, who is initiatory. And I'm suggesting that these do not necessarily have to be exclusive. So I can't answer your, your question with a, you know, a firm answer, but I do acknowledge that is an important question that's being discussed. And there could be, I think, truth on both sides of it. Thank you. Another question. Yes. Uh, the separation of the Umrah community. Uh, was it due to a disaffection in the established order, uh, which was uh, more concerned with the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the Uh, the, uh, I don't think the certainly disaffection with the rest of Judaism, and uh, I think the consensus at the moment would be that a uh, big part of this was that they had a different calendar, and so if you disagree as to when the Day of Atonement is, then you can't function together. Now, I don't think it's fair to say that that's a matter of the letter as opposed to the spirit. It is a matter of the letter of the law by all means, but uh, I think that I don't see any reason to say that they weren't interested in the spirit of the law too. So, but, but they were, I think, specific halakhi, there were a number of other halakhi issues uh, that you get in the text. Martin was talking about, especially. The spell out points of difference that made it impossible for them to be part of the same worshiping community as the rest of their, their fellow Jews. But you may want to add something to that. I, I did mention the, uh, the red heifer issue, which clearly set the, uh, the sect aside from the Pharisees, for, for example. So the Pharisees would, uh, would actually um, make the, the, uh, the priest that, uh, that was uh, using the ashes or the water resulting from the ashes of the red heifer. It would make him unclean simply because the Sadducees uh, followed the, uh, the rule of uh, Numbers 19. And it would appear that our Essenes, or whatever we need to call them here, followed the uh, Sadducees in that. And there were some 23 other uh, restrictions within the, uh, the MMT of similar sorts that set them apart from the, uh, the Jews of their day. And, and again, Define them as a particular group, I think, a lot of issues that set them apart. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts? Uh
as to whether there were other groups operating at the same time, who perhaps have left us uh, a certain cave on this side or that side, and uh, we'll discover it in the future. That's to say, what prompted you to think that this is the only group in opposition to the main body of Judaism at the time? Is it just the discovery of the schools, exciting as they were? Uh, but is there anything that says these and only these talk about divisions? It seems to me there were divisions like forever. Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't anything that says these were the only ones. You know, Josephus famously gives three groups and then a fourth, being the, the revolutionaries of the Zealots, loosely speaking. Uh, he mentions other people like this individual Banus that he allegedly spent some time with. Uh, but now this, this, I think, this is one of the dilemmas as to whether we should identify the people of the scrolls with the Essenes. Because they obviously have a lot in common with the Essenes. And there are some differences. And so which way do you lean on it? There could have been a hundred other groups for all we know. But on the other hand, we don't have any evidence of a hundred other groups. So, you know, it's almost a temperamental decision then as to whether you say, well, uh, these are the only groups we have evidence for, they're a lot like one of them, let's assume that they're the same. Or that a hundred flowers, that a hundred sects bloom and uh, uh, say that there could have been any number of them. Uh, Daniel, and then we don't want uh, Carol Ann to let Craig off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Abbott, I was wondering about uh, the Galatians, the Judaizers, and Paul is specifically addressing the Galatians, uh, since that's where he's using works of the law so much. Do you think that those Judaizers actually were seeing the works of the law, like the initiatory things, as being salvific, as opposed to just needing maintenance? Yeah, that, that uh, you yeah, know, the Galatians uh, Judaizers, uh, they understand works of the law in the same light as our sect uh, that we're looking at here today. I would say yes, they did. I think that's part of the uh, how the, the scrolls has helped, have helped us to understand uh, Paul's literature, for example. And as it's done, and Sanders and Tom Wright have gone uh, this way with the uh, material as well, so I'm not alone here. But the, uh, the important thing, I think, is that uh, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 3 especially, do make it clear that the issue is not salvific, but it's a one of continuance. You know, Paul was not saying that the Judaizers were claiming that one is saved by doing these things. He's saying that one is declared righteous, and that's a different sort of issue. If one would take a little bit of time to unpack. But he begins at the beginning of chapter 3 uh, asking the question, you know, how did you get into this in the first place? You know, which uh, the answer there is clearly uh, by the Spirit, you know, and by, by repentance, by commitment. And then he says, how then are you going to continue? You know, what is the step here? Are you going to do that by works of the law? So the issue is not, uh, it's not one of uh, being saved by works of the law, it's a continuance of maintenance by works of the law, I feel quite certain. And that uh, is, uh, you know, here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the first time now, we have a community that uses that terminology uh, that uh, we can examine their other documents to, uh, to see how they would have handled some of these issues. And it, uh, it becomes clear to me in examining it that uh, that, that is that it's only underlined the fact that uh, they didn't see these things as salvific. They saw them as uh, means to righteousness once one had repented and joined the community. Craig, do you wish to readdress uh, the question? No, that I'll, I'll say just a, a little bit about it. I, I thought about it, but I wanted to pay attention to Marty's question, but I wasn't even thought on uh, Professor Jansen's question. And that is, I, I discuss three typologies. A typology is a pattern. Uh, it's, a, it's an event in the past that is felt to uh, have meaning and, and tell us lasting things. And so it, it's like history repeating itself with theological meaning. Typology should not be confused with uh, allegory or symbol or cipher or something else. Those are different things. And so I thought about what other typologies might there be uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I considered like this 
disfigured Melchizedek, but I don't think that's a typology. Even if Hebrews uses Melchizedek to create a bit of a priestly typology, I don't think Melchizedek uh, functions that way in the scrolls. He's a figure, uh, perhaps literal, perhaps uh, in a symbolic sense of someone to come. I thought of the, the uh, city of Damascus and the Damascus kind of the way it's used, but that can be either literal or again symbolic. I'm not sure it's, it would be correct to speak of as a typology. Uh, and then there are other uh, offices, figures. Again, how specific or symbolic, we don't always know. Teacher of righteousness, the wicked priest, that sort of thing. But I, I don't think those are typologies either. And so uh, I'm happy to uh, hear thoughts from Professor Dave Baker Collins if, uh, if, if a typology comes to mind, besides the three I've talked about. The, the Europe mainly used to get a take in terms of patterns of design in this movement. That's right, correct. Yeah, but there are lots of uh, I call them motifs, such mm -hmm. as the New Jerusalem, for example. The motif that you get in a number of places, it doesn't go to define this movement. Or the sort of the material I was talking about, the, the pattern of the, the servant, but again, I wouldn't say it was right. definitive in the same sense. Um, is our new covenant? Uh, that is a, that, the new covenant would be a possibility because we're yeah. talking about events in history, the giving of the law at Sinai, and the restoring of the thing. Again, it might be more of a motif. I'm not sure. I think what you're, yeah. you're, you're underscoring, uh, Carol, yeah, is that it's not always easy to bracket it off and segregate some of these concepts. But typology, nonetheless, as difficult as it might be to define, one of the, I think it's a, a, an important concept because it was, you know, it was, there's the belief that God hasn't changed. And the God who brought Israel out of Egypt long ago is the same God who will do the same act of salvation. And that's behind creation. typology. New creation? Yeah, you know, I'm intrigued by that. New creation, new Jerusalem, maybe, maybe those can be explored in terms of typology. <laughs> I have perhaps one more. Perhaps. And this is, it becomes difficult to know where to uh, put the, uh, the lines here. Uh, Craig mentioned the number 12. Well, how about the number 7 based on uh, the, uh, the creation week? Seven then becomes uh, influential in our figuring of the Jubilee, which is no longer 50 years in the scrolls, it's now 49. So it's divisible by seven, not inclusive of either end. And then the year becomes not our solar year of 365 and a quarter, it becomes 364, again divisible by seven. So the, uh, the seven typology may be uh, That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Time for one more question, and then we'll uh, take our break. Uh, just one. Um, something for Dr. Epic. Um, MMT, it seems to be one group is addressing another group. Uh, we may, let's just say, for simplicity's sake, the Qumranites and some sort of Sadducees, and although they're not very hostile, I think most people have said that, and, and he's basically saying, look, uh, you know, just get it right, here are the laws, and uh, for the sake of all of Israel, you know, this is how to do it. Um, it seems that everybody's already in. Um, but he doesn't seem to be saying, you've repented, you guys have come clean. Uh, in other words, it seems to be addressed to a group that's, we're all Jews, for the sake of Israel, let's go this way. Um, um, I, I think at one point you said today, that for, that for the people at Qumran, there was a repentance, and this is maintenance, but it seems MMT strikes me as not for the group at all, just, hey, for everybody, for all you Jews, he has a way to go, and let's go this way, and he's not rebuking them at this point, he just seems to be saying, if you, if you, if you get it right, then we're all going to do well as Israelites, so I don't even see repentance anywhere. That's a good point. There is um, no repentance in the end. There's no entering into anything. Yeah, so but what then I want to with Paul, um, uh, going coming to Paul, uh, um, 
there's, there's, there's a difference here because Paul said, well, you guys have had a repent and come right with God. Now, now, now the works of the law are necessary. But in, in Qumran, in, in MMT, he's not saying, well, you've got God's forgiveness and grace. You, 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 you've been converted. Now, now let's, he, he just seems to presume, you, let's just get it right and, and then we'll all be fine. I, I, I'm having a problem there, actually now that Paul's he got he meant to repent somewhere else, but in, in MMT there there's no repentance. I, I I'm putting my finger on something. I just wonder if you could tell me what. Well, I, I actually thought about that very point. So yes. let, let me tell you where it's taken me because I think the, uh, the community consensus, if there is one on MMT, uh, from the uh, point of view of the writer, would be early on it was suggested that it was the teacher of righteousness. Yeah. Everything becomes the teacher of righteousness when, when it's person and I. <laughs> Personality, whether that's true or not, we don't know. It could be. Uh, I, I, I tend to doubt it. I suppose if, uh, if we're pressed to it, but it, it's an individual within the, uh, the community that is writing to someone that is outside the community. That's clear. And then we have this third group, or the they guys, you know, who are influencing those that are outside the community. Now, the, uh, the group that is outside the community was uh, very early on identified with perhaps the. the uh, uh, the priests in the uh, in the temple and the high priest and those uh, who he might influence. Uh, I think, however, not for the very point that you uh, that you raise here, Peter. There is no there is no uh, uh, significant actually there's no evidence at all uh, dealing with repentance, and that's not all. The uh, the fact that uh, the uh, writer of the MMT is very conciliatory with that uh, person to whom he is writing to. He says in the latter part of the document uh, that uh, something to the nature of, now we know that, uh, that you know the law and that, uh, that you understand these things, but you've been influenced in these particular areas that uh, you've got to get yourself back in shape. It, it actually feels a lot like what, uh, what Paul would say to one of the groups that, uh, that he's uh, writing to, one of the churches he's founded, for example, that's been influenced by an outside group. Paul is writing to uh, to clean up the mess a little bit and say, you know, you haven't you haven't uh, thrown out the baby with the bathwater entirely, but you need to get back uh, on the straight and narrow, or else it could bring some rather serious ramifications in the future. So I do think that uh, I sense, anyway, from, from my point of view, that uh, this is the MMT, uh, the right of the MMT, is writing to someone that uh, perhaps is is a part of their group that has wandered astray a bit. So it isn't an issue of bringing up repentance all over again. It's an issue of a right interpretation of that uh, that we've already talked about and some of the points that uh, that maybe had been uh, part of their previous discussion. I don't know. It's a very important point that you bring up. If indeed the repentance is the first step to, uh, to becoming uh, a bona fide member of this group and having some uh, some uh, hope of being there uh, in the final day, then uh, then it isn't there in, in uh, MMT and we need to account for it. So it's, a, it's an important point. Let us express our appreciation.